Homer and Virgil. Well, decide for yourselves which is the picture of which. The question we're going to be looking at today is, is Virgil merely a fanfic of Homer or is he a genius? Uh, well, that's what we're going to be starting to look at, at least. Um, we've got this overarching concept of uh, the Homer um his two works, The Odyssey, The Iliad. The Odyssey is indeed one of the greatest of all stories. It's the original romance of the West. But The Iliad, the magnificent poem, is not much of a story. Um, well, that might capture your slight feeling about the Aeneid. First half, a great original romance. Second half, not much of a story. Let's explore a bit further about basically what that's actually like. Have a look at this interesting little video that I uh, found the other day. Well, uh, you can decide for yourselves whether uh, that's a, a fair, fair and valid assessment. Um, but um, here's a useful, interesting quote from uh, G.K. Chesterton. I, I think it captures some of the home of that. Iliad is only great because all life is a battle. The Odyssey because all life is a journey. And then there's a biblical reference, the book of Job, because all life is a riddle. But we've got that kind of idea of life being a battle and a journey, which is so central to the Aeneid as well as to Homer. So what I wanted us to try and think about is how far is Virgil indebted to Homer for the plot and the details of the Aeneid? Um, we've got a range of possible quotes that you could have a look at. These are on page 51 of your booklet. Um, and um, what an appropriate one at the moment. My friends, this is not the first trouble we have known. We have suffered worse before and this too will pass. Um, is an interesting concept to be uh, exploring at the time of the coronavirus. Who's that by? You might have thought that was a, a Homer, but actually it's Virgil, even though he's talking about the Cyclops, etc. But look at the similarity to the next quote. My friends, we are men who have met trouble before, and this trouble is no worse than the, when the Cyclops, and then that's the Odyssey in Book 12. The parallel is actually uncanny. Uh, while they were speaking to one another, um, Dawn's rosy fingers... Um, had uh, already run a uh, heavenly course. Yes, you're right. Homer starts with Dawn's rosy chariot, Dawn's rosy fingers the whole time. But it's a Virgil quote from book six. Strange. A large and heavy shield which he decorated all over and round which he placed a bright triple rim of gleaming metal and fitted with a silver sh shoulder strap. You might think that that's a familiar Virgil reference, but no, it's the Iliad, because that is the shield of Achilles, not the shield of Aeneas, which again is a derivative um, thing that, uh, that Virgil's taken. Uh, and thus he turned them over in his uh, hands, in his arms, admiring the terrible crested fire spurting helmet. That is the Virgil reference. Um, then we have the storm reference. A squall came howling from the north, catching his sail full on, raising this waves to the stars. An enormous storm. Oh. You think it's all to do with the Odyssey, but there it is, Virgil again. As when disorder arises amongst the common people of a great city. Well, that hopefully you recognise as a Virgil quote. And then as a strong man with a sharp axe strikes a farmyard ox. Well, that's the Iliad because, of course, the Homeric simile um, is uh, inherent all the way through the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, the difference being here that one is a, um, a political reference, um, Virgil's one. And the Homeric one is a farmyard and an agricultural reference. So when we have a look at these different counterpart op options and incidents in the uh, Virgil and the Homer, we've got this collection of references to the two. Uh, there you can see down the right-hand side. And I just wanted to show you how these things are paralleled so similarly. Virgil utilises the funeral games from Homer in his funeral games on Sicily. The storm that dogs the Odysseus journey uh, the whole time in the Odyssey, 
There's a storm in Book One of the uh, of the Virgil. There's a truce between the Greeks and the Trojans. Book Seven. Oh, there's a truce between the Latins and the Trojans in Book Eleven. Rage. Have you got this one yet? Hopefully you have, because it's Book Ten. It's Aeneas's furore, isn't it? In the underworld, we already know familiarly Book Six and the parade of heroes there, and we've just referred to the gift of arms and weapons, the shield of Aeneas, which is similar to the shield of Achilles. Um, Odysseus' Adventures of Book 9 to 12, they're paralleled exactly in Book 3 of the Trojan Travels, and the assembly of Book 2 when the Greek fleet appears outside Troy and is listed at great length. We have a similar thing where the warriors of Latium gather together in Book 7. The opening of Book 1 of the Odyssey um, is paralleled across, isn't it, to, uh, to the start of, um, of Book 1 of the Aeneid. Uh, I sing of arms and of the man, um, and uh, that's similar to book one, Tell Me Muse, of this man of twists and turns. And then The Fall of Troy, familiarly book two. The scholars on this do give us a, quite a nice range of stuff. I, I think Camps is a, is a, is a nice uh, one to pick up. The Aeneid is a poem wholly different in character from the Homeric poems, yet it recalls them on every page and is constructed largely by the remoulding of Homeric materials. Maybe that word remoulding is the critical one, that whilst the Aeneid is different, it's also the same. Um, we pick up that kind of same concept running through Morwood's view that Virgil clearly felt in some important way the second Iliadic half of his poem was greater than the first. And uh, that's actually what um, Virgil himself says. Um, as uh, he gets to book seven, he says, now begins the greater part of the work. Um, still replicating the pattern of Odyssey and Iliad. And then finally, the Aeneid itself is destined both as uh, designed both as bipartite and as tripartite. And this is really interesting from Boyle, I think, because on the bipartite structure, this looks perfectly Homeric, doesn't it? Books one to six is the Odyssey, book seven to 12 is the Iliad. However, if you impose a tripartite structure, which means three parts rather than two parts, you break it up into books one to four with a tragedy of love, and that's all about Dido. Books five to six, which is all about the destiny of Rome. Think about the Parade of Heroes in six, Shield of Aeneas in, in eight. And then books nine to 12, which is the tragedy of war and Turnus. So it's a two possible interpretations there that you can take from scholars. So finally, uh, as, a, as, a, as a thought here, to what extent was Virgil indebted to Homer for the plot and details of the Aeneid? And this is what we're going to go on to investigate. Firstly, yes, the details. We have the gods. Um, it's characterised in a very, very similar way. Uh, the structure we've talked about, Odyssey and Iliad. And the style, Homeric similes um, and um, lengthy descriptions of battles, etc., and we have a number of critical events, the journey, the storm, the fighting, truces, etc. that we've looked at. On the other side, no, perhaps not. The Roman history and the themes are so dominant, so significant, that it's difficult to claim that um, it's entirely Homeric, obviously, in terms of content. There are some key incidents, especially the Dido uh, story. I, I think that whilst Odysseus does meet women on his travels none of them affect him in the same way that Dido does and you could argue that the emotional development of characters is much more significant in Virgil than it is in Homer and then the themes of Amor and Furor and Paetas seen running all the way through Virgil are different aren't they to the Homeric themes which are focused more around uh, Xenia and uh, around Nosos and around Cleos and Timae so I think there are a number of differences and we need to investigate and decide for ourselves which of those is the dominant. So remember, as a broad concept, Homer is expansive and Virgil compresses his detail. This is because uh, one is an oral poet, the other is a writer. Homer doesn't need to be compact and tight and organised because he is going to tell a story and it means his story feels very different. Virgil knows that his lines are going to be written and they will stay permanently exactly in that form because he's a poet who's a writer rather than a poet who's a bard. And that will have a stylistic difference. So that is our introduction to Virgil and Homer and the extent to which they're overlapping. Now we need to think whether you think it's a fanfic or whether it is a 
Kiss.